Hello and welcome again to Trey Red TV. I'm Mia McNay and my guest today is Marty Wilde. Hi Marty. Hi Ian. And of course Marty had many hits in the late 50s, early 60s, still tours and performs today and is the father of Kim Wilde and Ricky, Roxanne and Marty Wilde and Marty Jr. who have all had interesting careers in their own right. And we're going to talk about Marty's life, the, the dramatic part earlier on with all the big hits and, and uh, what surrounded that and also find out more about him as a person and also his family and how he supports his family very practically. So Marty, um, you were telling me on the phone when we talked uh, a couple of days ago that actually you were quite a lonely child and you spent time in North Devon which really kind of you got attracted to nature during that time. Um, yeah I did I mean my father uh, was moving around he was training men during the war he was a sergeant and uh, so he went to Devon then he went to uh, Capel Keurig in North Wales and I learnt to swim in Devon and I learnt to love the countryside in in Devon and in Capel Keurig so it's a lovely it was lovely in a way. The only thing that I suffered as a uh, as a child, I think, I think was to be on my own all the time, quite a lot, and also to um, to miss out on education. I, I mean, in Capel Keurig, I was the only uh, uh, English boy in a Welsh school, and a lot of them were Welsh speaking. So, um, it, but I mean, they were lovely people. Don't get me wrong; I love them to death. But it was. Uh, it, for education wise when I see my grandchildren now and they're like studying on computers and they're about three years old I think wow do, boy <laughs> did I miss out <laughs> well it was different times wasn't it yeah it, it was it was and yeah. you and you were you were born in 1939 yeah. yeah so the war was going on yeah so it, it was, was very different times it was but your father was a great influence on you in terms of your music wasn't he yeah he was um you know he when the radio, I mean, obviously he loved he loved music, and when the if the radio was on, he would he would always he would sing the song first if I remember rightly, but then he would harmonise. He was always harmonising, and um, I picked that up very quickly. So, at a very young age, you know, I, I was I'd always be harmonising with a song. It was a most natural thing, and he he. I can remember singing, they got me singing when I was, I don't know, maybe two, three, whatever, um, at one of the army camps and I used to wear a little white beret and they got me old and the, the army boys would say, go on, go on, because my name is Reg and they say, go on, sing Reg, go on. And then, and dad would, would ask me to sing, so I sing something, the son of Sergeant Smithy it was, <laughs> and um, very proudly, I was very proud of my father and uh, very in awe of my father. Great times. <laughs> and then uh, I think when you were about 10 or 11, he bought you a ukulele. Yeah, he did. Uh, there was a boy in our, in, our, in our school in Charlton Central in South London. And uh, his name was, if I remember, it was Jimmy Monday. And he had a ukulele and he brought it into the, the, the school one day. And, uh, and I saw it and I said, can I, what, what can you do on that? So he played a couple of things. And um, I said, I thought I'd love one of those. So I went back and said to mum and dad, you know, I said, um, I said, uh, could I have a ukulele if, if possible? You know, um, I'd, I'd love to have one. But dad was on strike at the time. So it, things were a bit tight for money wise. So anyway, in the end, I was over in uh, Trafalgar Road in, in, in South in Greenwich. And uh, there was a, a pawn shop there called Pockets. And there was a Keech uh, ukulele hanging there in the in the window, and it looked fantastic to me. And I and I said, "Oh, Dad, I've seen this 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 ukulele. You know, any chance of?" And, and I thought well, there'd be no chance, but they got it. So that was that was it. And who taught you to play? Did he teach you well, to play? Or well, G Jimmy Jimmy showed me a couple of basic chords, but the ukulele is so easy if you've got rhythm in you. For any child, you know, any young child, that's what, um, you know, I've always been saying, uh, like so many other people, ukulele should be in every school, 
every school yeah. should have ukuleles for the youngsters because one of those kids is going to be just like me. He'll have that ability to play the rhythm. And I mean, you've only got to put your finger on one to, to play the, C, the G or the C. Or the C is easy, the D is fairly easy. So, um, you know, that, that's how I started. And then, then, of course, when my father, they used to have these weekends where you could go on the bus they would, uh, if you if you were working for the tra London Transport, they would take you away to South End for the day or whatever. So I used to take my uke, sit upstairs in the, in the fr front, and and the, and the, and I would sing to people. So um, because I was so lousy at school, I was I wasn't I wasn't doing very well at school, and I didn't I didn't have great self esteem. I don't think as a youngster, uh, that I got self esteem out of this. It was. Suddenly, I was I was actually noticed. I was, you know, looked upon and and uh, respected. I suppose you could say. But I, and I'd be playing all the songs and silly little songs in in those days. Um, were but, they songs that you wrote, or they were songs no, you no, heard? No. And no, they were no, they, they they were some of them were George Formby songs because uh, my first chord book was a George Formby ukulele book. And uh, so I think, and as I say, I felt great. It may you not, know, <laughs> I f felt like I felt like a star. <laughs> yeah, well, you were a star on the bus. <laughs> on the bus, yeah. yeah. And then, then you had a, you had a, you were telling me earlier, you, you had a gr one of your grandmothers. She used to tell the fortune with tea leaves. And when you were very young, apparently, she predicted yeah. that you would be famous and travel the world. Yeah, she did. She. Yeah, it's it's a strange it's a strange story, but she used to tell fortunes by tea leaves, and um, that you would. Uh, by what my father told me, they would empty empty their tea, the last remnants, and then she would study the tea leaves, and she was uncannily accurate, um, frighteningly so. And with me, I was six months old, and she said to my father um, that I would be. Uh, I was going to be very musical. I would travel the world, and I was going to be—I uh, would not necessarily be a star, but uh, there was something was going to happen. And whatever I needed, as I got older, they were to make sure that I got it. Um, so I suppose that goes back to what thinking of the ukulele. Um, although they never told me, which was the lovely thing about it, they never told me until I was uh, seventeen. I, I just, just. In the in, just started in the industry, and Dad said, oh, "I've got to tell you this. This is your grandmother, s spelt out exactly." And yeah. it wasn't just me. She she would tell other people their fortunes. Always very accurate. Never there was no it, it, you know like sort of guessing. She told one woman's fortune. Cause the woman got upset. She told the woman she would divorce. She kept on insisting that my nan tell her fortune. She said, "I don't want to tell you fortune. I don't want to tell you." And I was, there's something in there I don't want to tell. You got to tell me. She said you're going to get divorced, and she'd not long been married. And yeah. she said, the war will end, and you will be working in a huge a white building. She said, and, and eventually she did. She got divorced. She worked in Greenwich uh, Naval College, which is a big white building with pillars. That's what she said. So she was, and she was just a, you know, it's just a. I don't know. I I don't know, and I don't understand these things, but. <laughs> Well, it worked for you. It she worked for me. For me it sure did. Yeah. And then there was a teacher at school that was also very supportive of you, your musical side coming out. Yes, there was. Uh, there was one particular teacher who, who, we were always listening to, you know, the things like the Billy Cotton Band show or the, 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 the in those days it would have been the Guy Mitchells and the Frankie Lanes. But this teacher, um, he, he, started bringing classical records and I latched onto them almost immediately he he explained to us that to listen to this listen to the beauty of this and I could hear it I could hear that beauty I could understand what he said and I, I don't think some of the other boys classical music would be like looking out the window you know sort of like tapping and getting getting a bit um you know fidgety but I used to I would sit there absolutely spellbound and um that's one of the things uh, that has lasted, I still love my um, Rachmaninoffs and Tchaikovsky's and um, Shostakovich. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that stayed with me. 
So what were your pop influences at, at an early age? What did you listen to as a teenager? Pop uh, oh, would have been, uh, Frankie Lane was my favorite. I always I was, I love Frankie's voice. I love his delivery. It was his, everything was dramatic with Frankie, you know. And uh, I love Frankie and I loved uh, Johnny Ray. I thought Johnny Ray was great. And um, Guy Mitchell, I used to like the Guy Mitchell songs at first, but as time moved on, I moved a, a little f further away because the, the, the songs were a bit, they were slightly twee, if you know what I mean. But Frankie's weren't. I think uh, one of the, I, I went to see the film uh, Blowing Wild um, and Frankie sang the title song and it still knocks me out now. The Norman Luboff Choir, that's when they made records. That's when they really made records. Mm you know in in like five or five or six takes with a full orchestra and a huge choir you know and all bang on the money singing in tune and everything not like, not like today which changes a little bit today because now they can alter it by a computer they so. can do so much <laughs> yeah yeah so, and skiffle was starting to happen wasn't it too when you were it teenage? was eventually yeah that moved on after after the uh, the frankie lane and the johnny rays and the guy mitchells along came lonnie and of course that the great thing about it are uh, from the ukulele i'd bought a uh, after with the uh, being able to play that it was dead easy to to move on to the guitar and i'd bought a guitar just before the skiffle um craze started so of course you know i was well away i mean because all lonnie's songs uh, were mostly in the g's and the d's and the c's and so i was off and running you know i could i could i could sing these songs i could, I could play like i did when i was a child on the bus playing to the to the to the older people there i was i was i had a head start you know and i loved it i absolutely loved it and uh, i i have great respect for uh, lonnie there was only one thing that I think which is uh, which I wish had happened to Lonnie in a way I think Lonnie wanted to be which I understand he wanted to be uh, an all-round star and I do understand that but I think when I listen to uh, some of those early tracks he had an incredible blues voice I wish and sometimes I wish he just maybe Developed made more it, albums yeah. yeah like that and and maybe a slightly different image, but he was an astounding, an astounding singer. And then um, after that, uh, the the influence would have been going to see Blackboard Jungle, Rock Around the Clock. You know, then uh, that was that was an that was incredible. That well, was rock and roll, rock, rock Around the Clock was the Bill Haley was the the record that changed so many things. Didn't it was it? the record, yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, it was this. It was that colossal rhythm. I, I, the, the voice didn't mean that much to me. Um, it wasn't my kind of voice. So Bill Haley wasn't my kind of singer, but um, it was totally adequate for that song. It was perfect for that song, and but the rhythm section was just so good. Uh, you know, when it, when it compared to what had gone before, yeah. um, you know, because all you'd heard was big bands. And the, the accent now with uh, with Blackboard Jungle was the, was the, was the offbeat, you know, that dunk, 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 and that rhythm that was that sort of that was it. That was it for me. And I thought, right. So I said to the boys, I had a group at the time called the Hound Dogs. You had that uh, as Reg Smith, Reg and Smith and the Hound, Hound Dogs. Dogs yeah. yeah. So I said to uh, the boys, I said boys, I said, no more skiffle. What do you mean? I said rock and roll. I said that that's it. We've got to. <laughs> We've got to do it. So, yeah, you reckon so, Reg? I said, yep, definitely follow me. And um, so follow my lead, rather. And uh, so we started to then, from Fetch a Little Water, Sylvie, we started to go into, um, you know, The Girl Can't Help It, or no, well, no before that, it was it would have been Blue Suede Shoes and and that, that kind, those kind of earlier Elvis tracks and, and Jerry Lee Lewis tracks. So great times. So um, what happened was you, you actually had a daytime job working as a messenger boy in the city, but yep. obviously your love was the music and you had the band. Yep. And then you had a break, didn't you? There was a publisher that, that found you and got you uh, yeah. two, two weeks in clubs, I think. I think yeah, the publisher yeah, was... Yeah, the uh, clubs were the Condor Club uh, and the Blue yeah. Angel Club, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got... Uh, Joe Brunelli was the man. He was a lovely man, and Joe, um, Joe had faith in me, and uh, and and 
got me two weeks work and that there were you know condor and where was the other club i've forgotten now the, the other club was the there was the blue angel blue angel yeah. that's the one the blue angel the condor one is condor club is the one that that that's that stays out in my mind um because it was it, it was a it was a kind of a hippie place at the time in in uh it was in soho right in the middle of soho and it was very hippie you could anyone like anyone could be there you could have um oh i don't know sterling moss or or princess margaret anyone was 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 capable of being in that place at that time so that was uh and that was uh yeah that was and you got a you got a pound and a bowl of soup for your I troubles did. yeah yeah i did yeah no spaghetti spaghetti was yeah it? okay yeah a pound a pound a night a bowl of spaghetti and um I used to, uh, I used to, because I'd, I'd come up there by bus, and um, I used to get uh, 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 all the girls. Some of the girls would be calling out to me in Soho, and they'd be, "Hey, you know, wh what are you doing with that guitar and all this, you know?" And I'd so we'd be walking on there, and wondering what, what the hell was going on. It was such a such an incredible area, Soho, in those ye years. It was a tough area, um, but it was exciting, and. Um, I used to go up with my guitar and I'd catch the, they, they arranged that I would be able to sing and then I'd be able to catch the last bus home. <laughs> I can't remember what time it was, but it was pretty late. Uh, the, the last bus back to Greenwich from, from, uh, from Soho. So. And then one night, Lionel Bart was in the club yeah. and he saw you and he thought, you've got real potential. Well, he must have done. I mean, I, I never met Lionel. Uh, not at that point, I didn't. Um, but he... Uh, he was friendly with Larry Parnes, who was Tommy Steele's manager. Yeah, and he must have—I mean, he must have really impressed upon Larry that I must have had something, you know, uh, uh, as a as a rock and roll hopeful, um, because Larry, um, I, I I I used to go to the, the church, and uh, not as a not as a as a church person at all. I'm, I've never been, but it was a great way to meet girls and to meet <laughs> your mates you know <laughs> so i've never heard of that paul going to church to oh meet yeah, girls. <laughs> yeah of course you do yeah well we had there was a youth club as well you see okay it yeah. was all tied in the youth club and uh so we used to we used to hang around uh, outside the church afterwards talking i said well i said i'm off now and i used to catch the bus they say bye they say bye reg yeah I'd see you off i went home and when i got home my mother said she said there's been a man at the door she said um and he he wants to sign you up as a singer so i said wow i said well, he wants to sign me up as a singer she said yeah so i said what's his name she said larry Parnes. and i knew that name you know that that name was he was tommy Steele's manager and i was absolutely it was a life-changing moment it and was, he hadn't actually heard you sing at that point had he, he never heard me sing no yeah, he, he goes to your door, bangs on the door, yep. as a contract. With a contract. <laughs> Do you see? It's extraordinary. Yeah, yep. with a contract. All, all in, all in. And uh, because I was so young, I, well, I was 17, but um, uh, mum and dad had to, they had to sign the, or my father had to sign the contract. I couldn't, I wasn't, I was too young to sign minor, it. Yeah. yeah, so it was just, it was like, it would be like for a youngster now, so it would be like someone in in I don't know in in Halifax. Um, well, I'm better just to make up a name, but anywhere, uh, and suddenly Simon Cowell's at the door saying, "I want to sign your daughter or your son up." Yeah. It was just, it was hit like a ton of bricks. But I, uh, when when Mum said that, I I just had a feeling that was it, and yeah. I'd always wanted to be a singer. I'd said I was going to be a pop singer. When I was fourteen, I told all the all the girls and all the guys, "Yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that." So, and I thought it's just a natural thing, um, <laughs> which it wasn't, of course, but it seemed to be to me. So, it was great, great times. And what deal did he offer you? He offered me sixty forty. And who got the sixty? And who got the forty? I got the forty. And, and he got more than you. Yeah, of course, but why not? Why not? <laughs> but he he also. He, uh, I've just read. I read it recently in one of the in one of the teen magazines, one of the beat ma in the beat magazine, I think. Um, that he that was the same deal that Tommy was on, sixty forty. Yes. So I, I wasn't the only artist, but after that, 
it, uh, after that, he he put everybody on a wage. They were on a weekly wage, <laughs> and I'd, I I would never have adhered to that. My my I would have said if if he'd have said he was going to put me on. I know it sounds sounds incredible, but if he'd have said to my father, you know, he will be on fifteen pounds a week, whatever it was, I'd have said sorry, Dad, no no deal. I I had more. I had faith in in what I was going to do. Yeah. And of course, one of the one one of the conditions was you had to change your name. You couldn't be Red Smith anymore. Yeah, well, that well, that was a good. I mean, he, he Larry was a uh, was a, a a gambler, and and in many ways, I suppose I was as well. Um, and he said, well, he said, I've seen this film. He said with Ernest Borgnine, and he said, and um, it's a great film. He said, and you remind me of of of, of him playing the part of. Uh, uh, I said, what's it called? He said, Marty. Uh, so he said, well, that's the name I see. So I said, I don't see that at all, Larry. I see Reg, I like to keep my name Reg. Uh, he said, well, I, I like Marty. So he said, oh, I said, and the next name, he said, Wild. I said, oh, I said, no, 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 no. I said, Patterson, because uh, I, I was a, a fan of, of boxing and Floyd Patterson was a, a very worthy champion at the time. And uh, I said, no, it's going to be Reg Patterson. He said, it's going to be Marty Wild. He said, I, we're toss coin for it. Uh, typical Larry, it's fate, I guess. He tossed the coin. First thing he said, "You're a Marty." And I, oh no! I said, <laughs> he said, "Call again." I called. <laughs> Wild. And <laughs> uh, anyway, he, 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 I got to say that a few weeks later, um, I saw my name in print for the first time, and I realised I was wrong. He was right. Yeah. Yeah, he was right. It was the right name. And how, how was your mum and dad with that? Well, I think dad found it, you know, dad used to find the whole thing a bit a bit comical, I think, of being a rock and roll singer. But um, I think mum, mum was great because, oh, within, she slipped into Marty within a few days, you know, so she, I, I think she kind of accepted. Um, but, but, I mean, now and again, I still get, I will still get the odd person who know who from Greenwich or from that part of the world, the South London uh, boys or girls, will say hi, Reg. You know, so they it's still there sometimes, but not so much anymore. <laughs> so you actually got a deal fairly quickly. Phillips Records offered you a deal, yeah, yeah, and you were doing some live dates and getting a good response. And so during those dates, were you you doing cover songs? I guess obviously, weren't you? You were yeah. doing American covers mainly. Yeah. And so you got the deal with Phillips, and then. Your first couple of singles didn't do a lot. Then you recorded a song called Endless Sleep. Yeah. And that took off. Yeah, it did. And it was, it it managed, it was very difficult because uh, people like Cliff and myself were working with jazz musicians, basically. They were all jazzers. And it wasn't their fault. They didn't know much about rock and roll. And so they had to sort of, like we were, we were learning to be rock and roll singers, I guess, or to try to come up with something a bit different. And they had to try and play rock and roll and they, they couldn't do it very well. And so we were very lucky to have got the sound that we did with End of Sleep. You know, we, we it, it was just a great sound. It still sounds good. Um, it, it, the, the, the background guitar uh, phrase sound still sounds great even now. Um, but and your voice sounds a bit like Elvis, though. I don't know if you were trying to imitate Elvis. Oh, I was very, very much in in the in the Elvis, uh, uh, yeah, that 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 influence. I was no question about that. But um, the fu yeah, it's a funny thing, you know. Is that, I mean, I'm getting on a bit now, but on on reflection, um, I, I used to. Th <laughs> you know, we all. Uh, Cliff was just the same, and I was the same. Billy was the same. Billy Fury. So we, we all used to want, we, everyone wanted to be an Elvis in a way, and we all had these ideas, but none of us actually really sang like Elvis. We were ourselves, which yeah. is quite remarkable, really. Because I, I thought, oh, I'm, I, I definitely sound like Elvis on this, but I never did. I, just, I had my own sound, and so did Cliff, and so did Billy, you know. But you had this kind of moody image. Was that something you manufactured, or were you partly a moody person yourself? Uh, yeah, I was. I think I was moody. I was kind of a uh, very laid back. I was l very laid back. Uh, I would never, 
uh, I wasn't, I'd never push myself. Do you know what I'm saying? I, if there was a, uh, I remember there was one time where the, there were a whole bunch of us and, and uh, they asked to take a press picture. And I can remember that they were all, everyone was vying to get into the, to the front of the picture. And I thought, to hell with this. No, I don't want to do that. And I just stood at the back there and they catch me and I smile. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not, I can't push like that. I don't. And uh, so I kind of, I was that held back all the time, a bit cooler. I think I was a bit cooler, if that's the word. But it was more by accident than design, I can assure you. But, but I was moody as well. I was the moody. girls liked that, didn't they? They liked this moody, sexy, sexy image. I guess they did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they never complained, put it that way. <laughs> and at that time, there was these... Uh, TV shows, Oh Boy, Six yeah. Five Special, and oh, you were yeah. on those frequently. Yeah. I remember seeing you on those frequently. The Oh Boy show was a sensational show. It was a landmark in pop TV, no question. It was very special, very special. And Jack Good was a genius. Jack Good, the director, um, he he taught taught me things, and Cliff in particular, and Billy uh, taught me things. Well, I, I still, I'm still influenced by Jack Good to this day, and I know Cliff would have been as well. The influences um, that he he gave us were were profound, and uh, we were so lucky to have had him, you know, and so lucky that we were able to deliver. Because if you if you couldn't deliver, then he, he couldn't use you. So mm. the very fact, I mean, he spent he would spend he spent one day, the whole day from eight o'clock eight thirty in the morning till around about 11 at night working on one song and that was Mac the Knife with me mm. and, and mm. non-stop and I want you to look here the camera see the lovely thing was we wasn't like I did a did a Dick Clark show in America and it was awful it was awful I, it was a, you just walked in stood in the front mimed to, to the record which was Bad Boy at the time and it, it, that's not creative Jack Good would would Jack Good directed you like a like a film director. So Jack would say, right, um, he'd do a little sketch. He'd do a sketch of a screen. They say, right now, and he'd shade in your face. So he'd say, right now, there's your face. I'm gonna. Put, you'll be in darkness here. So I want you to look there. You look there, right? He said, now on that word there, bang, come over. You get it? Okay, yeah, got it. And of course, that for Cliff uh, as well. I remember Cliff. He said, and uh, he said, uh, he was sending Cliff. He wanted him to. I'm pretty sure he said, like, I want you to grab your shoulder, turn me loose, turn me loose. And I want you to do and come, you come forward and get, and I, you can bring your head down. I'll bring that camera down. He knew the angles. So it, we were, we were being gifted mm. by, by a highly intelligent, um, wonderful director. And which they never did in, in subsequent shows that followed it. They didn't do that when you did Top of the Pops. You just went there and had to, you know, you had to be fortunate enough to be a, you know, be able to had to work it out yourself. Yeah, to basically. deliver. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned Billy Fury, yes. and you kind of found Billy Fury, didn't you? Or he found you and gave you a tape, and yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he was up in Liverpool, and uh, I think it was in a Soldo Theatre, Birkenhead, somewhere like that. And um, he, yeah, he 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 come backstage um, with a, uh, he had a guitar in a in a soft case. I always remember that. You could always tell when you were, you were working class. If you had a so, if you had a heavy case, <laughs> <laughs> you were you were you were doing all right. But if you had a soft case, you were like me when I started. And he came there and it, so he, Larry said uh, he's written these songs. Said, okay, so I said go on and fire away. So um, he started singing. So he actually started, played you the songs. Yeah, 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 he ah, played me a song. Ah. And he played me, if I remember rightly, maybe tomorrow. And I thought, that's a hit. That could be a hit. And uh, anyway, so at the end of it all, <clears throat> Larry said, you know, the, the, uh, like it, Larry was thinking, I think, in terms of maybe we could steal some of the songs or, but, and use Billy at the same time. So I, I said, well, I, I, you know, he's written these songs. They're his songs. I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, if I if I'm gonna do songs, I'll do my own. But but I said I think they're that that sounds fantastic. I said and they put him on stage. I think pretty much on that on that show. He said, well, 
you know, go out and sing a couple of songs with your guitar. And that was it. He was off and so running. He, he turned up with his guitar in a soft case. Yeah. That he was on the stage that yep. evening. Yeah. That would never happen now. No. Nope. And no. Jimmy Tarbuck. Jimmy Tarbuck used to kind of hang around at the Liverpool Empire in Liverpool when I was up there with, with myself and Hal Carter. And who was my, my um, uh, carer, minder at the time. And um, Jimmy was always make me laugh. Jimmy Tarbuck always made me laugh. He was the same person he is today. And, hello, and it was all that bouncy. And he used to tell these gags and I'd laugh. And one day at the Liverpool Empire, something happened where we, we didn't have the combat. And, and Larry said, y you, you, you said, Marty said, you're, you're, you're a, a funny man. Could you go out and introduce the next act? So Jim said, yeah, I could. I could do it. And that was it. I've, that, so that's how things were. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what was all the screaming and the adulation and being mobbed? What was that like for you? It was just part of the job, really. I never took that side seriously. I don't think um, you... I don't think I but never girls looked, throwing themselves at you. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I never saw myself that way. I mm. used to look in the mirror, and I, 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 I wasn't what I wanted to be. You know, I'd like to have been five times handsomer, and you know, like whatever. You know, cleaner teeth or whatever. But um, you know, I never, I never saw myself that way. I don't think a, a lot of our very few artists. Well, maybe I don't know. Maybe some of the others did, but I didn't. I didn't. I thought I, I thought I didn't like my voice and I didn't like my face. So there we go. <laughs> <That's strange. laughs> uh, and what was your relationship with Cliff Wright like? Because you were billed as kind of rivals, but from yeah. what you've been saying, you got on quite well with him. Yeah, no, no, I was never a rival. Uh, well, I was rival in so much as obviously, you know, if you could outdo him, um, if I could outdo him um, on stage, you know, if I could uh, without sort of like like saying get out of the way and I don't mean that kind of outstaging but if I could sing better or if I could do or if I thought I could do something better then I would try but no we we got on I he, he was like me I think he was we were very similar and and Billy was in a way we were we weren't the people that the press and and the camera portrayed we were just ordinary guys really and and quite quiet quite shy in, in many ways and uh, no he was uh, I liked him from once we started talking you realize what what a man is what what he what he's like and so we, we hit it off straight away and still to this day it's never still remained I oh yeah I'm competitive yeah I was sure if I can get a better song or or, or be number one in, instead of being number two uh, obviously behind him I would I would want to overtake him but 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 no it ended there we we liked each other too much for that so your first few hits were all covers, yep. and then you wrote a song called Bad Boy, yep. which became a big hit. Yep. So what was the reason you started to write? Because at, at that time, that was quite unusual, yeah. that those kind of acts wrote their own songs. Yeah, it, it, it was frustration. It was as simple as that. It was, it was just, I, wouldn't, I wasn't getting the material that I, that I, that I wanted. And, uh, and I, th it, it, it was, it was just, you know, I've always said um, necessity is the invent. You know, is, is the mother of all inventions, and mm -hmm. uh, it was necessity. I needed to come up with something. So that's how and my song. Oh, I'd been writing songs. I'd always been writing songs since I was a young child, since I was a tot. Um, but um, suddenly, it became pretty clear to me that I had to try and come up with something. And oh, so, that. was it hard to write "Bad Boy"? Did it come pretty quickly? No, it came quickly. And did, did you get the lyrics first, or did you get the music first? I, it, bad Boy, I think the title came first. Mm. I think the title came first. I'm, I'm a big title man. I, titles are the, which I learned, uh, who learned that from? Um, um, well, I'm trying to think who I learned that from. I'll think in a minute. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's titles are, the, are, the, are the, one of the most important things. Maybe not so much in this day and age, Although I think it's still nice to have a great title, but in those days, titles were very important. Yeah. Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole, Nat King yeah. Cole said he would never record a song that, well, he didn't like to record songs that didn't have a great, great title. Yeah. And, and I was the same. Yeah. And did you see yourself as a bad boy sometimes? 
Um, oh, well, uh, yeah, I kind of had my edge, I guess, you know, sometimes I, yeah, I could, yeah, I, I was just like any other guy, really. Um, I had my good sides and bad points and ups and downs and, but uh, yeah, I suppose I could be bad, you yeah. know, but if I'm pushed, if I'm pushed my back to the wall, um, then I become a different, I'm a different animal then. <laughs> So you met Joyce Baker, who was yes. in a group called the Vernon Girls, an all-girl group yeah. who had a few hits. And it was a very dramatic, well not a dramatic meeting, but you fell in love, didn't you, pretty quickly with her? Yeah, yeah, she was, yeah. Um, and it's a strange thing, really, because in visually, I can still see that scene of when I first saw her. I can still remember that. I remember really? That. Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, she was sitting on, a, there was a kind of a long bench, Canterbury Lane in London, I re, we were rehearsing, and she just joined the girl, I'd never seen her before, and I looked at her, and she had a kind of short jeans on, and a little white top, and uh, I thought, wow, I, you know, this, this was, and yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd been out with a, one of the Vernon girls, just, uh, or just briefly, I know several, I've been out with a couple of them actually, but um, only briefly, and this, uh, she, uh, it was the, it was a, the attraction was, was pretty immediate, it, huh. for me it was. Huh. And you got married, <coughs> you got married within a few months of meeting her, I think? Uh, no, a bit longer than that, um, probably around about seven months, seven months, yeah. seven or eight months, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got and, married. And Larry did say to you, this could be the end of your uh, career as a pop idol. Yeah, he, I mean, we were all very aware, yeah, he, he, we had a meeting and it was discussed. I mean, uh, it, it was pretty obvious because in those days that, you know, nobody ever got married in, in that, at that point in their career um, because you'd lose all the, the, the fans, you know, the, the, the girls uh, as fans. And, um, and I, so... I, you know, I didn't want to lose the fans, but I, I had my life. You know, I've got a life to lead. I can't, I couldn't be subject to, to being kept in a little cage all that time without, you know, I, I had to be me. And um, so I said to Larry, look, I'll take my chances on that, you know. And to be fair to Larry, Larry could have put a lot of things in our way. Um, but it was, in those days, it was approached to me that maybe... Joyce could be uh, my mistress, but I, I didn't, I didn't like the idea of that. I knew my mum and dad wouldn't like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> interesting how these values were at the time. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, different days in those <laughs> days. Yeah, different yeah. days. I mean, some things you oh my goodness me, you didn't, you know, you didn't divorce. I and mean, divorce was like, oh, you know, prison was oh, was even worse. Nowadays, prison. Divorce, whatever, it's there all the time, <laughs> isn't it? So. so you got married, I think it was the end of 59, 1959, and, but the hits kept coming for a year or two, and they started to get more scarce and dry yeah. up. And what was your feeling then when the hits started to dry up a bit? Well, again, I, yeah, I, I, I wasn't happy about that, but you, you can't, some, some artists can carry on for, for longer, you know, and, but, I didn't have an option. I wasn't. I just wasn't selling records, so I had to move on and start thinking about doing other things and try to be stronger in other areas of my career. Um, so I did. Uh, I went on to to do um, a Bye Bye Birdie at Her Majesty's Theatre, yes. uh, which was a great experience. And um, so yeah, I had, and the films. I had a couple of films, but the films I didn't take very seriously. I. I just thought, well, it's just a way to earn money. And the only film I really enjoyed was uh, What a Crazy World, which was with Joe Brown and my buddy. And uh, that that was because uh, we had great, great, uh, phenomenal fun making it. Yeah. We were always in trouble, mind you. But together we were lethal. But never mind, we won't go into that. <laughs> we were terrible. Oh, dear. You had two films first, uh, Jet Storm and Helians. Yeah, and Jet they were, yeah. They weren't so much your thing, really. <laughs> I think they. Were, well, I, I look the other way. I, funny enough, they they come up on on the on the nostalgia programs now, and um, I, I I saw one the other night. Jetstorm came up, and um, I thought, shall I record it? And I thought, 
No, I won't. So <laughs> I don't and won't, won't watch my own stuff. And the Hellions came up recently. I watched that? No, no, I thought no. Joyce does. She watches them. And I watched a bit of What a Crazy World, but I quite enjoyed that. It's kind of, um, it was irreverent uh, uh, in many ways, but it, it kind of, and of course, a lot of things that you, you would never be allowed to get away with now making a film like that. Um, it sort of crossed a lot of boundaries, but it was great fun. So one of the things that I find quite impressive was that when you started writing, you decided to be self-published. You didn't sign all your songs away to a publisher yeah. and Joyce was helping you manage yourself. So yes, you were, did. after you left Larry Pines, you were kind of taking back control of the other aspects of your life. Yeah, I was. Uh, there was a time when I had about three records that I'd written in the, in the charts and it was put to me to sign to a company um, and they were going to give us uh, a, obviously a, a large amount of money in advance and it would have bought my house almost outright that I was after at the time which I'm still living in to this day and we were saving desperately to try and get this house and we, we, we wanted to move in by a certain period of time and so if I'd have accepted that I thought, oh, great, you know, uh, me and my simple thinking, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll sign <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll buy the house outright or, you know, we'll get, we're guaranteed to get the house. And Joyce said, no, no, she said, no, no, no don't do that. Said, you mustn't do that. She said, the money will come at some point, but don't do, be free, but you got, must be free, free as possible. And of course, you know, she was, as, as so many times in my in my career, she's been a, a phenomenal guide, you know. I mean, I was, I'm the easygoing guy, you know. I trust everyone. <clears throat> Everything I've ever done was always on a handshake. If someone said to me, when I, you know, I'll give you whatever it is, you know, this is all the money I've got and I'm giving, I would believe it. Joyce wouldn't. Joyce would think, hold on a minute, what's the, what's the catch? <laughs> so, you know, she, she, um, She's been like that throughout my whole career, but of course it paid huge dividends once Kim's career started because I was free as a, an artist, uh, uh, as, a, as a writer, yes. to f have our own company, which we had with obviously with with, yeah. uh, with Rack, with Mickey Most Company. But but actually before that, you you um, co-wrote Jessamine, which was a hit for the Casuals. You wrote for Lulu, I'm a Tiger. And one of the early status quo hits, Ice, yeah. Ice in the Sun. Oh, Ice in the Sun, yeah. So, and also, are uh, you telling me on the phone the other day, uh, Peter Shelley's Love Me, Love My Dog, you also yeah. co wrote with Peter. So, yeah. that's four bona fide hits that you were involved yeah. in writing, which weren't recorded by you. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a smart move. And there aren't, there aren't, I remember someone like Dave Clark, he was very early on, he, he realised that. <coughs> that you had to own things and not sign everything away. Yep. But there wasn't so many people from that early era. No. <clears throat> so, um, as, you, as, as you mentioned, um, you just mentioned Kim, obviously you have, the four, you have the four children. And Kim Wilde, just tell us the story about, which again you told me on the phone, about how um, Ricky was playing a demo to Mickey Mouse to own Rack and he heard Kim's voice, <clears throat> uh, Mickey heard Kim's voice as a backing vocal, and then said, I really like that voice, who's that? Yeah, and, and <clears throat> then when he saw Kim, um, he, he, he was very positive that he wanted a signer. And it was strange because Ricky was, was the one we were pushing. Ricky was gonna be uh, the singer. Rick, Rick had a you know, fine voice, great voice. And he was signed earlier to UK Records, wasn't he? Yes, he was. The Jonathan, Jonathan, <coughs> Jonathan King's label. Yeah, that was, that was much earlier on. That was, a, um, yeah, a, thankfully a brief thing. That was a, a mistake that I made in a way um, on reflection. Uh, I, wish, I, I wish I hadn't um, uh, pushed him. I didn't push him into it. I, I mean, he was, he was a young kid and he, he, he loved music. He loves music. And he's a great musician but he loved music then like I do and we were doing this really oh, so, I'm gonna, I mean, so the problem is with me in so way, so many ways I am so damn naive and when Rick was start to record I was one of the songs I wrote called I'm an astronaut and uh, things like that for him but they were for children they weren't I never saw the big picture they saw 
um, you know, they saw it as a as the Osmonds. You know, he was going to be like an Osmond type kid. I never saw it that way. I thought he's just going to be called. We're going to write this, or we're going to get this song. It's just going to be a a, a young person's song. But of course, that changed, and um, I began to regret it. So. I was glad when that, that era, that, that part of his life ended, and I think he was as well. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, but... Um, so Ricky was signed to Rack with Mickey Mouse. Yeah, yeah. he was, yeah. <clears throat> well, Rick was very, is, Rick, Rick is just a, a fantastic, he's in what I call, he's, he has the touch. He's got that touch. He's got, he's, he's I mean, I've worked with, with some phenomenal musicians. I, I've worked with guys that could, play Rick off the stand. They could blow him away with technical prowess. Um, Rick, Rick's big thing would be when they got in the studio, Rick would come up with the arrangement. Rick would come up with a sound and while they would be playing their huge technical piece. That was his, that was his great strength. And of course, that's what um, part of the reason I think Mickey was attracted. This guy was, you know, Ricky was delivering great had a great soundtrack uh, that we were we were uh, bringing. I was part of that, but not. Uh, it was just a part of it, you know. Was, obviously, it's, I helped sometimes in the backings, and obviously, and and with obviously, I was writing the lyrics and everything. But uh, not all of them. I mean, the, in, sorry. And, and initially, it was a Ricky song on his own um, that we went to Iraq with. But when, once he saw Kim, that changed, and I couldn't work it out. To be honest. Because <laughs> Kim, to me, she was she was my, again, you know, my naivety. Um, I saw her just as my daughter, and why not? And um, she she had shortish hair at the time, but suddenly it started to grow. I think Mickey wanted her to grow her hair longer, and she changed the colour to blonde. And I can always remember one day, I. I came in, in the kitchen and there was this girl and I thought I don't know you I really don't know you and it was Kim huh. in full full Kim image you know this suddenly yeah. this girl in front of me had changed like a chameleon you know within months and um, yeah it was but when I think the interesting thing for me anyway was that Mickey heard Kim's voice yep he said well he could be interested in doing something with, with Kim and then you and Ricky wrote Kids in America yep. pretty much in a day. Is that yeah, right? Virtually a day, two days maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So you wrote this, which I think was number one here, quite a big hit in America. You wrote it that quickly. Yeah. And that was her uh, yeah. first single too, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Kids in America is, uh, well, you know, it's like songwriting is a huge part of my life. It's been, uh, uh, it's where I've, I've, uh, managed to have a, a great lifestyle and it's and it wouldn't through singing rock and roll and um yeah it was the i like telling stories as a, as a lyricist and at that point i was just a lyricist uh, although i was as i say I used to help with the backings i'm very i'm very in um i'm very interested in sounds and the way they're um, you know the way they apply to a record. So I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a arranger, but so was Rick. That was a great advantage we had. The pair of us together were two arrangers, and um, so with with Kids in America, I had the title, and Rick had the Rick had this had the, was working on this little baby computer. It was going ba 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 da 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 da. And so I listened to this melody for a while, and I thought. I said, I can see this, this girl's face as look, see kids in America, see skyscrapers and a girl's face behind it. I said, it's going to be about a girl. It's going to be a, and the, it, the outlook of that, that girl that was portrayed, because I like to write things like a, like a movie, like, like Paul Simon d d did with all of most of his songs. You, you were watching a movie when you were listening. And I wanted it to be like that with kids in America. This kid's looking out the window thinking, what the hell am I doing here? I'm going out. You know, it was a great night. It's going to go out to clubs. And um, that, um, I wanted to portray it that way. And uh, thankfully it did. And it, it, it kind of, that's why for, in some ways it's not really dated because the attitude of the girl in the, in the story 
was like, you're going to do it my way. It wasn't one of a, a subservient lady like they, they uh, like they were, to, or some women were. It was she wasn't going to be like that. She's telling the guy, don't look at your watch, don't check on your watch, and kind hearts don't don't get you anywhere. You know you've got to be tough. So it was kind of, and it suited Kim. It was, it was yeah. a, a good vehicle for her. And it's interesting because, as, as you know, we now Trey Red now um, look after the catalogue, Kim's catalogue. And I always check the, the streaming figures and every month Kids in America streams around one and a half million times. So that you're right, the song is held up. Mm. It's like young girls are still identifying with that mm. song. And I think, again, you told me earlier, it's you know, part of how you saw Kim, you saw her as very independent, mm. her own person, mm. not <coughs> just as your daughter, but this mm. own mm. young woman who had her, had her own mind and her own mm. way. Well, to this day, I mean, you know, if I'm doing wrong, she, you know, I, you, know you, you get picked up in my family, I get told off, you know, <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to put up with any nonsense. I'm being polite with that word nonsense. They're not going to put up with any stuff from me. And if I'm wrong, if they think I'm wrong, and she's always been like that, Kim, she was always very strong willed and wanted, always wanted to go her own way. Um, but thankfully she was, um, she had a great guide in Mickey most. Mickey, yes. Mickey played a huge part. Uh, Ricky and Mickey and Kim and I were a, were a strong team. Okay, and then looking at my notes here, it reminds me she also toured with Michael Jackson in Europe. Yeah, it must have did, been quite yes. an experience. It was mind blowing. But you didn't get to meet Michael Jackson. No, I didn't. No. Be honest with you, I had an opportunity and and I did I did have an opportunity when he was at Wembley. They were doing six or seven shows there at the big stadium. And someone and the, someone came up and said, Michael will see uh, Kim if she would like to go down there. And so someone said, well, you, you, you go with her. And I said, N no, no, I only did. Not that I didn't, I, I revered him as an I was one of the best acts I've ever seen in my life and outstanding, but no, it wasn't me. And I was, again, my old laid back Marty, I thought, well, I'll let someone else go. I think Joyce went down with uh, Kim, but the only reason that he met her was because the press were onto him saying, you know, come on, when you're gonna have a picture taken together. And he, he was almost, almost forced into it yeah so um but um it was just phenomenal too a phenomenal phenomenal experience one of the great highlights of that 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 thing for me was people you can imagine because it was michael jackson they would f try to obviously everyone wanted to meet him backstage and unless you were um someone very way up the scale and hierarchy and in, in terms of stardom you weren't going to get there you weren't going to meet michael jackson unless you were very special and the one I love most of all was I can't remember who the president was but it was the president of France was there was a whole batch of us backstage and he was there waiting to see Michael Jackson I think Jackson <laughs> kept him waiting for about 25 minutes and I love that I thought you're great that was one of the nice things yeah fantastic well you can remember Michael Jackson's name but you can't remember the name of the president of France so that yeah, sums it up really yeah, isn't yeah. it <laughs> well, yeah <laughs> There was only one Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. So, with your family, and I, 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 you know, I'd like to spend a little more time on this because you're such a family man, and all your four children have all very been successful individually. And Roxanne, your other daughter, she's worked pretty, pretty constantly, and she does backup vocals with Kylie Minogue, doesn't she? When, yes, she does. When yeah. Kylie works yeah. live. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the whole well, the whole family really musical, and and the grandchildren are as well. That, they they, they frighten me to death at times. They're, they're so talented, um, but I, I guess it's the same in all families. But we are very. Uh, one thing I have learnt from this uh, in 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 my life, looking back on it, is the gene factor, the genes that are, that are passed on to children, and there's no question in my mind now that that is right. They are things are passed on. Um, my Ricky, my Rick is, uh, he's got what I, what I had in me, but much more technical ability than I had. Uh, he was much more able to express what was inside him via his keyboard and via his, his melody lines at, at that point in his life when I, I couldn't, but that didn't come to much later in my life. 
Um, and your dad had this ability, yes, pretty he latent, did. but he, he did. somehow, as you say, gene-wise, you he, had that from your dad. Yeah, he, he, there's no question. And in the grandchildren, I've got, I've got a grandchild, no big, little Charles, no big this, and Theo, and they sing, go around singing all day long. I mean, I know ch all children do it, but um, and I, it's just, there's just something. I can't explain what it is, but there's something. There is some quality that's in this family. Uh, that, 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 uh, and it's in all families, don't get me wrong, and uh, if, if there's a strong gene, it will go right through the whole family. And what's held your family together? Because it's quite unusual. You know, you're, you're a rock and roll star when you're quite young. You married Joyce when she was quite young, and you've been married together for must be, what, 60 years now, is it? Uh, yeah, it is, yeah. So what, what's the secret? What's held all this together? I think um, putting up with each other, and not walking away from at times when you could walk away from each other. I think um, there are times when you, you no one is going to have a family that is um, hello darling and kissing and hugging all the time. There is going to be a time when you you could you, know, you could smack them or whatever. You know you're not allowed to smack anyone these days, are you? Know, but but <laughs> you know you there are times when you you really. They, they get you, but there again, you get them, you know, they, you, you get on their nerves and you've got to put up with each other. And somewhere deep down, there's, there is that bond, there is that deep love, uh, which there is with, with all my family. Uh, there are, I mean, I, I said to my son many times, there are times when, you know, you're a pain, an absolute pain, but, but I love you. And, that, and that's, that's the main thing. And I think that's what holds it all together. To, to, you must learn to, to forgive each other you can't you can't hold on forever you know to you've got to move on unless unless i don't know unless you unless one of your children murdered somebody or that's a different thing entirely of course it is but um you you must learn to move on and and, and fight for each other you you must fight for each other as, as best as you can and it's interesting because the other your other um, child that we haven't talked about is marty jr who works as a um Landscape, landscape gardener, gardener. Yeah. and it's interesting that Kim has also written two books about gardening, hasn't she? Yes. So somewhere maybe they picked that up from you when you were in uh, Devon and Wales very early on, that love of nature. Somehow that's that's yeah, come down yeah. as well. Yeah, a bit of that, but also with Joyce. Joyce is, uh, was always okay. Joyce has always loved, and I've always loved flowers and things like. This. I, again, I never ever realised until one day I looked at my my iPhone and all the pictures I'd taken, every other picture was of a flower. I thought, why did I do that? Because <laughs> you don't realize, you, know, you go uh, click and then click. And instead of people, I'm, most of the time I'm taking pictures of flowers. Obviously there's something deep rooted there. Yeah. Which, um, but, but as well with uh, with Joyce and the family, we all love, we all love the nature, we all love nature and we all love the countryside very much. So you're about to, I think, embark on another tour, yeah. another package tour. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, who else is playing with you in, the, in this tour? Uh, Eden Kane. Wow. Um, Mike Berry. Yeah. And Nancy. And Nancy was a great singer, country singer, and a rock and roll singer. So yeah, we. Yeah, I don't know how many more times I can do this. I was thinking on the way over today, maybe it would be my last tour. Maybe it will be. I mean, as you get older. Uh, it, it it's like um, oh, I don't know. It's like it's like getting a, an old train that, that's been in the yard for a while. <laughs> you know, when you go out to do something, you've got to get organised. You've got to get ready. And the older you get, of course, it, it becomes more difficult physically. Is one of the problems if physical things come in. That would be the only thing that would ever stop me as a is a um, any any physical problems. But, but I you, love what I do. Your voice still holds up okay, doesn't it? My voice, I've been lucky with my yeah. voice. Don't ask me why. It's not a voice I like. It's not, <laughs> it's not a voice you like. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. I'm not. A, I'm not. I've, I've studied singing a lot. Uh, I, know, I, know, I know quite a bit about singing um, in a common sense way, not in a, always in a technical way. I know what's good and what's bad. And I know. I know it's something that resonates deep, deep inside you when you hear a Pavarotti or you hear a Sinatra or you hear a Nat King Cole, or an Elvis, or some of the younger people uh, you now that are, are coming through, or Rihanna. Rihanna's got a great, a great style. Um, 
they just you know it's just something special it's uh you know you know you just know what they what, how good it is and i don't like i don't i love i love opera i love i love hearing oh i love i love to hear a good a good tenor singer and pa pavarotti was i love pavarotti i just loved his whole aura the the, the the voice and i love but i mean not as much as elvis elvis was still my favorite <laughs> i gotta say but um Pavarotti, um, any any singer, not always necessarily a good singer, because I'm not a good singer, and neither was Buddy Holly. But Buddy Holly had a great style. Every time you turned the radio on, you knew it was yeah. Buddy Holly. Not good technically at all, but who cares? You know, it was the right voice. And great songs as well. Yeah, Marty, we're gonna have to finish there. Really appreciate you coming along to Cherry Red TV and uh, good luck on the tour oh thank I'll come you come and see you somewhere it was my great pleasure thank you thank you and thank you out there for watching uh cherry tv and i hope we see you again soon goodbye <laughs>